Hello and a warm welcome to you. Thank you for joining me for this lecture. This lecture was first given at City, University of London, during my ESRC fellowship year. And I'm looking forward to sharing my research with you. And it would be great if I could also find out what you think about it and how it relates to your work using the Register Your Interest page on my website, natalspace.wordpress.com. I am Sarah Joyce. I am currently in the School of Sociology and Social Policy at the University of Leeds. I am, I describe myself, as a middle-aged early career researcher, having practised as an architect since I qualified in 1998, also practised as an antenatal teacher for the NCT charity, and I volunteer as a parent, parent rep on my local Maternity Voices Partnership in Leeds. Today I'm talking to you about birth space design grounded in women's experiences of giving birth. This is the plan of the lecture. I titled this slide Smorgasbord because I've planned this lecture to introduce you to the range of my work. We will spend about 30 minutes on my PhD completed in 2018, the title of the lecture. And we will explore this through a 10 minute video I recently made and slides on key findings. Secondly, I also want to share what I'm doing as an ESRC Early Career Fellow this year. And then thirdly, give you a sneak preview of a research proposal I am working on with the School of Sociology at Leeds. So in total, about 35 minutes. Let's start with the video. I created this as a tool to explain my current ESRC fellowship role, but it also serves as a good summary of the PhD. Birth spaces design research. This project is funded by the Economic and Social Research Council and sponsored by the University of Leeds. Hello, I'm Sarah. I am an architect, antenatal teacher and volunteer in NHS Maternity Services. I am the researcher who completed the research that I want to share with you today. I believe this research can have a powerful and positive impact on the childbirth experiences of women, babies and families, especially with your contributions. At the end of this short video, I will tell you how you can become part of this project. How did this research come about? This is a research study completed as part of a PhD in the School of Architecture and School of Nursing and Midwifery at the University of Sheffield. After four years of research, the study became a 100,000 word thesis or book. This new project I'm introducing to you today aims to take the PhD findings and make them accessible to all those interested in birth spaces design. The study took place across two cities in West Yorkshire. In these two cities, there were three hospital consultant-led units, one alongside birth centre, that means in the same building as the consultant-led units, and seven women gave birth in their homes, including a boat. Twenty-four women took part in the study in qualitative interviews using drawing methods. These interviews took place in mo mostly in women's homes and they were asked to recall the most recent birth and draw what they remember of the spaces and we talked about their experiences at the same time. Having recorded the interviews, I wrote transcripts so that I could read those for the analysis for the research. The women drew on flip chart paper with pens and they also had stickers that they could use which I offered later on in the interview so they could think about how they felt about the space in terms of words and feelings but also thinking about what positions they might have used in those spaces. Here is an example of Heather's drawing. The 
study also looked at the policy and design guidance available for birth spaces. There are very few documents available. The key ones were made a few years ago and before the most recent maternity policy documents, Better Births. The thesis proposed that the current documents that we have need updating in light of Better Births and the research that I did. To summarise the findings, think about how women experience spaces during labour and giving birth. Their experiences are diverse, but number one, they are social. How the room, and also open and closed doors, help a woman manage her relationships with companions. 
are there spaces where she can withdraw and then also manage when she's with other people? She experiences them in a visual way, in a haptic way, so in way touching and feeling objects, also through sound, through emotions, through the physical nature of the space. Now it is time to tell you about the exciting new fellowship project that has just started. It's funded for one year and takes research findings from the PhD and disseminates or shares them as widely as possible. I would like to work with you to co-produce new forms of information sharing and digital media created using your experiences, skills and expertise and also using the world-class facilities of the University of Leeds. Register your interest in the project. You can go online to www.natalspacewordpress.com and go to the form on the Register Your Interest page. After filling that out, I will invite you to the events and workshops planned to start in January 2020 in Leeds. There will also be showcase events at the end of the fellowship in September 2020 in London and Leeds to celebrate and share our work further. What is your response to this research? How do you think it should be shared so that you, your friends and colleagues will get the most out of this new knowledge about birth spaces. If you have further questions, want more information, or want to be engaged with the Fellowship Project in another way, please also get in touch with me. Thank you. Let's have a closer look at the research and the findings. The PhD research aim was to understand how women experience the places where they labour and give birth in order to inform the design of birth spaces. To meet this aim, I address the following objectives. To one, explore how women experience spaces during labour and giving birth. Two, identify any personal significance women perceive or associate with these spaces and the events that take place in them. Three, appraise current design recommendations for spaces where women labour and give birth in the light of the findings from this research. Here I would like to share with you some of the thesis contribution. The thesis contributes a new architectural understanding of birth spaces as socially structured and time-based. I describe them in the thesis as being a socially structured spatial progression through time, but that now does sound quite clunky. Birth as an event is the catalyst for the creation of such spaces for women. And birth spaces exist in many different forms for women that reflect the many types of birth they experience. Such spaces are more social and relationship based than implied by current policy and design guidance. Current policy and design guidance also tends to conceive birth spaces as just one room. And this conception lacks the spatial complexity that women need to self-manage their proximity to companions and to self-direct the physical journey of their labour and birth experience. A philosophy of of birth-based design is needed that values people and spatial practices across venues and not just the technical aesthetics aspects of a room. We'll talk about this a bit more in the next slide, but birth spaces are presumed and curated special experiences for women. The thesis offers evidence-based practical recommendations for design and a new paradigm for designing birth spaces as social space for women. It identifies theoretical challenges, both with the use of binary schema in existing research, for example, um, placing medical and social models um, in conflict with each other for maternity care, and the simplistic use of concepts such as homely, safety and risk, and also design seen as a technical tool for achieving certain clinical outcomes. And this is common in existing birth environment research. As an interdisciplinary piece of research, the thesis demonstrates that spatial terminology for birth spaces within existing literature is used without shared meaning. 
For example, across architecture and midwifery, the word environment does not mean the same thing. And this lack of a shared meaning results in a lack of coherent knowledge. Birth spaces are reimagined in the thesis as spatial accounts through drawing as a qualitative visual research method. Thus, the thesis is an exploratory and explanatory study grounded in interpretive spatial experience. This interpretivist, person-centred research philosophy, grounded in lived experience, has shifted the common focus of birth space design from averting risk to embodied experience, thus engaging with perception, movement through space, social connections and labouring woman, labouring woman's temporal otherness in inverted commas experience of space, so how space is experienced during labour, as potential inspiration for design. For you as an audience I have highlighted on the slide this idea from my thesis. Genuinely woman-centred birth spaces will emerge from understanding birthing spaces existing predominantly through human interaction, shaped by patterns of inhabitation over time and through a woman's interactions with material form as part of experiencing human relationships within connected spaces. Here I offer you definitions for presuming and curating spaces which I introduced on the previous slide. Presumption is a word that has come into use to capture how people create and use content on the internet, for example the way people create and watch videos on YouTube. I reappropriate this term for birth spaces. Curated space comes from feminist architectural theory that users can be experts in the way that they inhabit spaces and through this expertise create or produce spaces by selecting and organising objects in these spaces. I'll explain these terms further in the next two slides. You may not have thought about it in this way, but our built environment exists in two phases. It is produced by professionals, commissioners, architects, estate managers, clinicians uh, and built by building contractors. Then there is a second separate phase, which is when it is occupied and different people are usually the users, especially in public buildings like hospitals, but also in most homes, unless you are a Grand Designs self builder. Women who plan home births have a, to a degree the opportunity to both produce and consume their birth space, not only in the way they prepare spaces before labour, but also during labour and afterwards in the way they can change and adapt the spaces. The idea that users both produce and consume birth spaces is presumption. This is something, a facet of birth spaces that appears to benefit women in birth experiences. Curation of birth spaces is more common for home births than other types of birth. Home birth women have time during pregnancy to create certain objects for birth, for example, when a woman sets up a birthing pool or repositions items so the space feels right for their needs. I often think about how this might be made possible in hospital. Uh, I'm not sure how it is possible in a hospital and what kind of organisational changes would be required to make it happen and make it possible for women to plan in advance what the room is like. Managing the location of people is also an important part of this curating process as women place items or prepare certain rooms for certain people within their house. For example, locating the midwives in the kitchen with the tea, coffee and biscuits. And many women worried or thought about hosting, how they were going to host the midwives correctly within their home. And then they used interconnected rooms, so rooms with open doors, so that they knew where the midwives were, but they weren't necessarily physically in the same room as them. The curation process continues after the birth, as items in the birth space are dismantled by companions to create a different postnatal space during the woman's first moments holding the baby. Many women really didn't want to be able to see the birth space 
they had just been in and move away from it. In some hospital rooms, women withdraw into the en suites, whilst, for example, the bed is remade so that the room, when they return to the room, it feels like a different space. Having said these presuming and creating processes weren't really possible in hospital, there was one case where it did for this woman, Abinia. She said she wouldn't want a home birth, but that she had imagined that her experience was as close as possible to having a home birth in hospital. Her room was called the active birth room, but it wasn't often used and the reason wasn't uh, identified. It was tucked away at the end of a corridor. In general, the women preferred these types of rooms at the end of corridors because they perceived they were less likely to be disturbed. Women were in general very aware of what was or might happen on the other side of doors. We'll touch on the importance of doors soon. This was a room with an ensuite. On the left is Urbinia's drawing and I've put my photographs and a model I have made on the right to show that the two rooms were a similar size. In Urbinia's drawing the main room has uh, is larger in size which suggests it also is more important to her. She was able to move freely and did move freely between the two rooms. The rooms that women were most satisfied with in hospital were ones where they fe felt able to move freely between two spaces, almost like a suite of rooms, usually a birth room and an ensuite. So women used the ensuite as a, as a space to labour in. Sometimes these spaces are thought of as somewhere to go after the baby is born. Here are some examples of what she said about the room. In the first quote, she describes the furniture as feeling flexible. The room feels more fluid, she says. And also the room does not appear to be set up when she arrives. And she liked that because she could move or direct her partner and the midwives to move things into the centre of the room as and when she needed them. Her relationship with the room also started um, in before pregnancy. So she chose the hospital where she, in fact, had been born. And she'd built up an idea of it, the venue being the perfect place. She went on an antenatal tour where she saw this room and thought it was a fantastic space. Um, there was a continuity of staff in that the midwife that had uh, given the antenatal tour was also the midwife she had in labour. The room didn't feel set up to her, so it felt like there were um, objects in the room that she could use, but that, um, that someone else hadn't chosen where they were and she was able to use them in the way that she thought best. She had two spaces to move between. And then again, looking at the quotes, after the baby was born, her family visited her in the room and she says it felt almost like a room in my house. And when she left, it didn't feel like she'd been in a hospital. All these factors made her feel that this was, um, her experience was unique in the hospital. And this was something she hadn't really expected to have. She went straight home from this room and so she wasn't in any other hospital spaces after the birth. Thinking a little bit more about presuming and creating, here are some quotes uh, from women describing birthing spots and the way they told their birth story after home births. Nico used the phrase birthing spots to describe where her children were born. And the women at home knew exactly in the spaces where the exact spot where their babies had been born. There were two women, including Daphne, who were in houses that um, 
Daphne's house, she when they bought it, she didn't particularly like it, uh, but it was a good deal. But after the baby was born, she had a really strong connection with the house. And even though re before that she would have felt that she could have left the house, she did, no longer felt she could leave that house. And for Lily, it was a, a, a dilemma because she was in, a re in rented accommodation. And after her baby was born, she knew that she would no longer have, there would be a point at which she had no longer had access to the birth spot. And the quote here from Felicia is about how, uh, how women passed on that uh, affection for the birthing spot to their children and the connection they uh, developed with both the birthing spot and the connection that their children developed with where they had been born. So Felicia tells her older son and talks about where he was born, but she also feels that she could own the birth more because it's in her space and in her home and she has that ongoing access to it. So these places over time became really important for women who had access to where their children had been born, even though these spaces no longer looked like they did when the actual birth took place. A few other findings to share with you through the data. We're going to look at categories, furniture that fixes where people are in a room, curtains and doors. In the video I showed you, it did touch on categories. And the next two slides are what women said about categories. So they learnt about them through exposure to the spaces on antenatal tours, which is covered in the first three uh, quotes on this slide. They got a sense that rooms were high risk or low risk. And the middle two quotes here show how seeing the low risk rooms really boosted women's sense of believing they could give, give birth and they had the ability to give birth. Vitex's quote at the bottom is slightly different as she's talking about after her birth in the alongside birth centre and reflecting on that and thinking that actually being in that space did make her believe that she could do it on her own. So this exposure to the rooms prior to labour and birth, that it, uh, the knowledge that women gained from that then then used to interpret the rooms and to make their own interpretations of whether rooms were high or low risk. Then when women were re-exposed to these spaces during labour, they applied their knowledge of the rooms and made interpretations of how they would labour even without any input from a midwife. Women were particularly concerned about just being in a medical room. So Kwasia's quote about um, she was in a home from home room, which she was very pleased about, but she thinks about if she'd been in a medical room, there would have been something in the back of her mind saying that something was not right, even if she'd been reassured by staff. And Jasmine talks about how just the way that you move through the hospital spaces is a way of physically categorising you. And um, it's like a, a ladder system where you go either up or down the categories. And then in Heather's quote, she is comparing what she knows about the alongside birth centre with where she was on the consultant led unit. And in the consultant led unit, she was in a, a large room next to the operating theatre and she was aware of this. And so when she went into the room, she interpreted the location of the room within the maternity unit and the size of the room as meaning that not only was she high risk, but she was high risk, high risk. And also because she knew that there were other options, more low risk options, um, this really affected her and she felt that the birth centre was a heralded place that she was not allowed to enter. Changing the way that maternity units are designed through not using categories of rooms on architectural plans and in design guidance, I think would have a positive impact on women's experiences. I alluded to this idea when talking about flexible spaces working well for women 
or spaces that women interpreted as not set up already. So this is really the opposite, which is common in hospital spaces. Women often describe furniture in terms of who used it and how it located that person in the room. Here I've shown a common combination in hospital, especially in maternity assessment units which have curtain bays, but also in birth rooms. That women interpreted the layout in terms of there being equipment for the midwife, and that is where the midwife was located. A bed as a place for her, and the chair as being for the partner. But also women found, uh, women described that in rooms where there was a, a chair for the partner, quite often if they'd been um, more physically supportive in other spaces, that when there was this set up in the room, partners felt they should sit in the chair and became less physically supporting. Some women tried to um, swap over the roles of having perhaps a partner on the bed and them in the chair, but sometimes it was met with opposition from staff. Um, and one woman chose uh, to stay on the bed because she knew that it might be an infection risk if her husband was on the bed. Curtains play a really important part in how women experience hospital spaces with curtain bays. Design guidance doesn't cover ward spaces as spaces where women might labour, but many women used curtain bays during maternity assessment in labour and when induced. In these rooms, through the curtains they could hear other women's stories taking place through conversations, as Abinia describes in the bottom quote. They interpreted other women's stories and compared themselves to where they thought that woman might be in labour. So women often thought about whether they were ahead or behind that woman and whether the scenario that they were hearing was possible to happen for them. Also looking at the other two quotes from Yarrow and Gardinia, the space inside the curtains felt smaller to the women than the actual physical space because they didn't want to disturb their neighbours or move the curtains. So the curtains created a space that was almost like a reverse TARDIS, if you know um, the programme Doctor Who in the UK, where the space inside was smaller than the physical space. Doors are also really important and I think um, something that should be highlighted more in maternity care as something to think about. So it's known to be common and good practice to close the door from a birth room onto the corridor. But there are some other nuanced uses of doors. Doors, um, in a sense, indicate who has control over the room. Jasmine in the top quote here talks about how um, if you're in a hospital birth room and you perhaps want to do something that's um, a little out of the ordinary or you want to say no to a treatment, that, that there's a sense that the, all the staff um, and expertise within the hospital is available behind that door and that you wouldn't be able to control people coming into the space who could then persuade you to do something that you didn't want to do. So she felt outnumbered there and she actually, for her second birth, had chosen to have a water birth at home where she felt much more control of who was in the room and which doors were open or closed. Felicia then talks about the fact that when uh, she had her home birth, that in their house they didn't really close doors. Um, so they, she was able to move freely between spaces and actually the only door that was closed during uh, the labour and birth was the one that the midwives closed um, to the kitchen. And Bryony here talks about using the shared bathrooms in the consultant led unit that she gave birth on. So two rooms had a bathroom between them and both rooms had uh, doors on it and you had to lock both doors. But she could never really feel certain that she wouldn't be disturbed in those rooms and actually she could hear the woman in the other birth room through the doors 
I knew exactly where what her location was just by sound. At the bottom I've just given a, a quote from Design Brief for Maggie Centres uh, which are really interesting projects in the UK which are about creating spaces that are more homely for people that are receiving cancer treatment and the design brief is unusual in that it's a narrative about talking about how people feel in those spaces but here it says that um, the doors don't have signs on them even on the toilets because you wouldn't have signs on the bathroom door in your own home. Felicia here uses doors to protect her space, her birth space she's created at home. So circled in red in the centre is um, the birth pool that she had in her living room. To the left of the drawing is the, is the front door, which um, if you came through the front door you would immediately lead into the living room through a door there. But she thought about when the midwives arrived where she would like them to go. So at number one at the top she directed the midwives through a gate and then this took them down an alleyway to the back door, number two of the house. And then there was another door there into the kitchen. And she talks about there being three doors that they had to go through before they could get to her. So she wanted the midwives there, but she wanted to be able to control when the midwives arrived in her birthing space. Sage here was in a consultant led room which didn't have an ensuite so there wasn't a separate space to retreat to. She set up a space behind the door so on her drawing on the left hand side the door to the room which went out to the corridor and she knew uh, she could hear noises of um, things happening within the hospital along the corridor. But she identified the space to the right, number two on the drawing, as to the right hand side of the bed and the right hand side of the room has been a staff area where all the equipment was and where the midwives stayed most of the time. So she felt the door was protective being behind the door and also that she was away from all the monitors and all the activities of the staff. So this slide represents the final slide talking about findings from the PhD and now I'm going to move on to talk about what I'm currently doing and and then finally the project that is a proposal. The thesis is available online, open access. If you put Sarah Joyce birth space architecture into Google Scholar, it does appear. The work I'm doing this year is also about sharing this research, the PhD research as widely as possible. I have an ESRC Early Career Fellowship that I started in October 2019 and this runs for a year. On the slide are the aims of the fellowship. If you are at a similar stage in your research career I would recommend applying for a fellowship scheme. What I value about this year is having time. Between finishing my PhD and starting the fellowship I went back into architectural practice and that's a place where it's difficult to access the support and have the time to write articles from a thesis which it turns out I've discovered is quite a hard task. I'm working with my mentor for papers with target journals of social science and medicine, health environment research and design and midwifery. This year is also a wonderful opportunity to meet people and talk about my research. This year I've already talked to a lot of people about my research and for many of those people they have found the research fascinating and interesting and that it makes a lot of sense but they've never thought about architecture or birth spaces in this way before. So this I feel is, um, is a good impact factor that I'm having. So some things I have done I've presented at the International Maternity Expo in November. Here in this slide uh, I was involved in Baby Week Leeds in November uh, going uh, presenting and being at many events. This is at Leeds Market where there were also a number of health professionals that I was able to talk to and members of the public. I've also talked to people at the maternity units in Leeds and at the Maternity Voices Partnership. 
uh, I've also spoken to people uh, who were involved in public health in Leeds and the Future Standards Committee um, for NHS England who look at the health building notes, which are the design guidance for healthcare buildings. Uh, I met Hilary Bren at the Leeds Market and it was really nice uh, to speak to him and hear about him talking about his own experiences of becoming a dad. Another example of what I'm working on at the moment, I'm working with a consultant through the University of Leeds on some infographics which will hopefully be useful as handheld information for midwives who are working on labour wards. And I'm working with the head of midwifery at Leeds to arrange to meet Pan 5 midwives and team leaders and community midwives to share this information and find the best ways to offer the research to them so that they can develop their practice from it. Recently, I was in the engineering model making labs at the University of Leeds uh, using the laser cutter for these room models. And I'm hoping that uh, these room models, when they're finished, will make it easier to explain layouts to professionals, the layouts that women found helpful and also allow people to imagine and see rooms from women's perspectives. For example, the model in the bottom photograph will have a clear perspex wall so that you can see the room as if lying on the bed. I was really pleased to receive this email feedback from a woman who spoke to me whilst she was pregnant and we had a conversation about the idea of flexibility in the layout for birth rooms and she when she went into the birth rooms that were available because of that conversation she was able to imagine that there might be different setups that would make her feel more comfortable and she actually so and she felt confident to physically change the room and to ask midwives to help her to change the room Looking to the near future, I am I have recently completed the first stage of a, applying for a three year welcome fellowship starting in October 2020. And this is a sneak preview of a page from the second stage application. Um, I'm really keen to extend my birth space research to look at spaces in terms of being a continuum of experience for parents and to think about the undervalued or underconsidered nature of postnatal spaces and implications for postnatal care. The methodology for this research project is expanded and a bit broader than the one that I use for birth spaces and it uses multi-sensory methods. So thinking more about what parents hear, see, smell and remember about all the different spaces where they start to care for their baby. So fingers crossed for this one. We're now at the end of the lecture, so thank you for listening. And this slide is at the end so that you have access to my contact data details should you want to know more about my research. I would really love for you to get in touch with me. I'm really interested in talking to people about my research. Thank you for listening. <laughs>